Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Bad, crazy, and good martinis today. A little bit uh, different order, but uh, certainly two out of three relate to the events from last evening and into today and hopefully not much further in Ferguson, Missouri. The district attorney for St. Louis County uh, came out shortly after 9 o'clock Eastern time last night and said that the grand jury, in fact, decided not to indict uh, Officer Darren Wilson on any of the five charges that had been approached with considering by the prosecutor's office. So therefore, there will not be formal charges coming from from the DA and from this grand jury. That led to what many of us unfortunately expected, Jim, and probably worse than a lot of people expected, dozens of businesses, even those that had boarded up in anticipation of unrest, burned and looted, and in some cases both. And the, the carnage this morning is truly horrifying. You see some of the clips from the cable news channels, uh, reporters and their camera crews uh, ducking as gunfire broke out at various times last night. So uh, as you so aptly put it uh, in the morning jolt today, everyone lived down to everyone's worst expectations last night. Yeah, it's pretty deeply depressing uh, from start to end because we had had so much nagging sense that this could go very badly. There was all kinds of talk about the need for the schools to get advance warning when the grand jury decision was coming, that basically the police forces, the government, the governor called the National Guard, 100 FBI agents were on this. There was all these efforts just allegedly designed to prevent widespread violence after the decision was announced. And it really appears like it didn't do much good at all. For those of us who are rather skeptical of the idea that you serve any noble cause or justice by, you know, burning down cars in a lot or looting stores. I mean, you know, the fact that you're not happy with what the grand jury's decided doesn't give you the excuse to run off with a flat screen TV, which is what apparently was was actually seen last night. Yeah, really appalling. Uh, And it's very hard to be sympathetic to a community when there is so much lawlessness and so many people who see something this awful as an opportunity. Now, of the, you know, 60-some people who were arrested last night, only nine of them were actually from Ferguson. So the fears about outside agitators appear to be well-founded, and it just has been a very frustrating set of circumstances. And one of the things that I find really kind of you marvel at is that, you know, we, we follow coverage of this. A lot of people follow a lot of coverage of this. But the grand jury had access to everything. It sounds like that whatever you think of that prosecutor, he left no stone unturned showing everything to the grand jury. And uh, they decided there was not evidence there that this was an unjustifiable shooting and that a crime had been committed. So thus, there were no indictments. And what's kind of fascinating is that every single person out there who's furious about this cannot come to terms with, you know what, maybe the grand jury saw something or heard something or was able to examine some piece of evidence that I didn't that made them come to a different conclusion. Every single person who's furious about this is adamant. that They know 100 percent accuracy exactly what happened that night even though they didn't see it themselves. I think there's something very human about that, I think very depressing about that, that people are willing to commit acts of violence over their adamant stance that they know what happened when, in fact, they didn't. And that's good foreshadowing for our good martini, uh, which is coming up next. But here's the second part of our bad martini. Shortly after 10 o'clock last night, just a few minutes after the prosecutor had finished his presentation and taken a few questions, President Obama made a statement in the press room at the White House, the first part of his Uh, statement I think a lot of people would obviously agree with. He said that we need to respect the decision of the grand jury. It was their decision to make. Uh, This is a nation of laws, and we have to respect that. He said that we should honor the wishes of the Brown family, that no matter what happens, there should be no rioting and looting. Yes, go ahead and make your voices heard in a peaceful way, but um, you're not doing anything, just like you said, Jim, to advance the cause of justice if you just go out and loot businesses and burn things down and create general mayhem. The president didn't stop there. Here's a couple of clips that uh, some people think uh, did not help the situation at all last night. And we need to recognize that the situation in Ferguson speaks to broader challenges that we still face as a nation. The fact is, in too many parts of this country, a deep distrust exists between law enforcement and communities of color. Some of this is the result of the legacy of racial discrimination in this country. And this is tragic because nobody needs good policing more than poor communities with higher crime rates. We have made enormous progress 
uh, in race relations over the course of the past several decades. But what is also true is that there are still problems uh, and communities of color aren't just making these problems up. I don't think anyone out there is burning a, a you know, cars on a car lot because uh, of something the president said. Let's just kind of observe that, that having said that, though, President Obama's got a very difficult job going out after this where, you know, you know, it's going to be a split screen and there's going to be images of fire and angry protests and potential violence and, and all those uh, things on the other side of the screen. Uh, but one of the things that kind of struck me is I mean, he says, you know, there are Americans who agree that there are Americans who are deeply disappointed, even angry. It's an understandable reaction. Understandable, perhaps not justified, unless you think there's something wrong with this grand jury. But I mentioned, you know, a moment ago that that why should you be angry? I mean, you can be angry that that Brown is dead and you can say, I think, very justifiably that, you know, whatever he did as an 18 year old man, he didn't deserve to get shot for it. He didn't deserve to die for it. And ideally, even though the gentle giant uh, narrative pushed forth by the media early on turned out to be less than fully accurate, then ideally, you know, Brown would have had a chance to to go on and, and, you know, mend his ways, learn his lesson, pay his dues and make amends and, and go on to live a long and happy life. And he didn't. And that itself is tragic. And some people who are kind of angry about this, I think, kind of forgotten that particular angle of it. It's tough for the president to say the system worked the way it was supposed to, but it's justifiable to be angry about it. Well, if the system worked the way it was supposed to, why should people be angry about it? And I, I don't know if Obama ever, um, ever, ever rectified those points. And I think what it is is that he's, he's afraid to say the message to, to you know, certain corners of the African-American community that the grand jury worked the way it was supposed to, and that this this was the the way the grand jury worked in and of its, itself is not an injustice, and that there are a lot of people who want to believe that there was something unjust about this process, and I don't think there's uh, any evidence that was the case. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the district attorney Robert McCullough spent quite a bit of time at the podium uh, last night, and. One of the things he did, which is probably not going to make too many people in our business all that happy, but it is something that you and I have talked about. In fact, we talked about it last week as the cable channels seem to be licking their chops uh, almost in anticipation of what we saw last night. And here was his shot at the fourth estate. The most significant challenge encountered in this investigation has been the 24-hour news cycle and its insatiable appetite for something, for anything, to talk about, following closely behind with the nonstop rumors on social media. I recognize, of course, that the lack of accurate detail surrounding the shooting frustrates the media and the general public and helps breed suspicion among those already distrustful of the system. Now, Jim, you and I probably have a a better appreciation for efforts to get the story since the details weren't uh, out there than the district attorney probably does. But we've we've stated before that uh, the cable news channels were basically doing a pregame show the last several days just waiting for all this to unfold. It would be nice to to see some soul searching on the part of the media to see whether their coverage of this exacerbated the tensions and, and made things worse. I mean, if the whole if all kinds of cameras are there, on the one hand, they're there and they, they can record any um, misbehavior on the part of the police and, and such. But the flip side, the moment somebody puts a mask on, that's kind of a sign that they're up to no good. Right. We, we don't really see a lot of people who. Uh, uh, wear masks because they want to to make the world a better place when there's an angry protest going on, and you could kind of see this. I didn't watch I didn't watch throughout the night, but I watched you know the the immediate inactions. You could kind of see the anger building and the number of people who inevitably were acting out for the cameras. And there was a certain like reward for this that this is their moment of infamy. This is their moment to um, act out for the, with the whole world watching. And I kind of wonder if you know. I think it's very natural to say that that kind of exacerbated and made the situation worse. My colleague Catherine Lopez asked the question this morning: You know, by watching, have we kind of become complicit in this violence and in this? You know, the idea that people are doing this because they know there's an audience and that we have played a small role in it by providing that audience. But uh, ultimately, you know, if you like following the news, there's a reason you're watching it. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, there's any serious media analysis of this. But uh, I'm not holding my breath expecting a dramatic change in the tone and style of news coverage of of the next racial controversy to come down the pike. All right, let's move on to the crazy and away from Ferguson. And yesterday's good martini was the departure of Chuck Hagel as defense secretary, someone we thought from the get-go was wrong for that position. But the fascinating thing, Jim, and you touched on this a little bit yesterday, is just how quick and almost eager 
unnamed officials, of course, inside the Obama administration were to completely trash Chuck Hagel. The president uh, was a little bit awkward yesterday saying he's glad that Chuck Hagel now has a chance to attend more Nebraska Cornhusker games and spend time with his family. But uh, people behind the scenes say, oh, yeah, he was absolutely fired. He was not up to the job. He screwed up Ebola. And and the nicer things, of course, were, well, the mission changed. We actually have to engage in military action now. So clearly we needed a new defense secretary. Would have been a great defense secretary unless we had to fight someone. (laughs) Then he was just totally not the right guy. First of all, I hope, uh, considering the amount of anonymous sources within the administration that are trashing him, I really hope Chuck Hagel gets a sympathy call from Bibi Netanyahu saying, buddy, I've been there. Tell me. I know about it. At least I didn't call you a chicken. You know what? It's interesting because there was a lot of of strong opposition to Chuck Hagel's appointment going, you know, during his uh, the confirmation hearing and stuff. Certainly, I don't think any of them on the right was impressed with him as secretary of defense. But I think also as time went by. It was no longer an issue that he was necessarily the problem. The problem was a lack of clear strategy coming from above Chuck Hagel in the White House. As I laid out in the the morning jolt, it's kind of a really interesting and kind of disturbing portrait painted by Fred Kaplan of Slate, kind of suggesting that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs increasingly becoming the president's uh, preeminent advisor on defense issues, that the entire system had kind of begun to work around Chuck Hagel, and that he really was becoming kind of a non-entity in the shaping of policy, which is, you know, undoubtedly a bad situation. But also, if the policies are failing, you can't put that on Chuck Hagel either. Somebody was asking me, oh, is it better, you know, the, the, do we overvalue niceness uh, at the expense of competence in a, in a different context? And I think what's interesting about this administration is that it is incompetent, but it's also very nasty. Look, picking Chuck Hagel to be defense secretary when he was ill-suited for the job was a, you know, incompetent thing to do. But trashing him on the way out, is a nasty thing to do. Because I don't doubt that Chuck Hagel did his best. There are a lot of people who said he was kind of listless and exhausted. And look, it's an exceptionally difficult job, which is one of the reasons people were skeptical about it. Our nomination for the crazy martini of the day are these unnamed White House sources who kind of think that somehow they'll do themselves or the president good by trashing Chuck Hagel on, on his way out the door, when in fact it's exceptionally clear that really there's there's no vision there. There's no plan there. There's no sense of how... We're going to deal with situations like ISIS and its mess in Syria, mess in Iran, mess in South China Sea. You know, the idea that, well, by trashing Hegel makes anything better, it kind of shows that ultimately they are nasty, insecure, rotten little people over there. Uh, And I say little both in terms of stature and in terms of thinking. And, uh, you know, we got two more years uh, to put up with this, Greg. Yeah, it's hard to believe that people who associated with the guy who thought the American people were stupid would have not so nice things to say about people they worked with. If you think things are bad now, Greg, just wait for Defense Secretary Jonathan Gruber. (laughs) And you thought it couldn't get worse, you know. (laughs) That would be a fun confirmation process. Jim, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. And please be sure to join us on Wednesday for our special Things to be Thankful for Politically edition of the Three Martini Lunch.